From the beginning, the images we have created have stood like mile markers on the road of human progress. What once was is now because artists made it so. They captured a moment and made it eternal. Where did they get such power? Well, it was given to them, passed down through the ages, mastered a student, each building upon the other. John Stobart, one of the most accomplished artists of our time, says, I don't think the greatest works have yet been done. And it's true, but only if the secrets are given to yet another generation. The first secret is this. It is not in the hand, it is in the eye. Follow us and we'll show you that once you learn to look at the world differently, it becomes a different world, one in which nature becomes the greatest teacher of all. In the tropical paradise of Maui, after a three and a half hour drive to the end of a road as winding as you'll find anywhere in the world, John Stobart paints a little Hawaiian church and reflects on his life as an artist. Maui is the second largest of the Hawaiian Islands which are located towards the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Actually, there are 132 tips of land included in this group uh, that are all the top of volcanoes coming up from the floor of the Pacific Ocean. The island is 729 square miles. It constitutes two volcanoes with a valley in between. One of the volcanoes is about 6,000 feet tall, and the other one is over 10,000 feet. Now, it's the 10,000-foot peak that we are now going around the bottom edge of. And uh, what's happening is that the it's, it's quite steep at the top, but as it gets towards the sea, it, it flattens out more. But there, it results in many, many ravines. And it's these ravines full of tropical lush undergrowth that we're now navigating. That's why all these curves are here. We're getting around one ravine over a bridge and then round another. Maui used to be one of the less frequented islands. And in the mid 70s, only 50,000 tourists visited Maui. But last year, two million visitors came here. Much of the accessible coastline has become very congested. So to reach the outer lying characterful part of Maui that is much the same as it was in years gone by, one has to mount quite an effort. So here we are on the most windy road in the whole world. And about uh, 40 miles, there are 600 turns on it. We're heading out to the tip, the eastern tip of Maui uh, to a place called Hana. This area was populated originally by ancient mariners from Tahiti who, who used their power of, of observation to navigate across the Pacific thousands of miles by canoe. Uh, this is an incredible thing, really, when I come to think of it. The staggering thing is that this all occurred a thousand years before Columbus discovered America. Those early explorers were masters at observing nature. They found their way around by looking at the stars and watching the currents and the swells from distant islands, and that's where, how they found their way all, all over the Pacific. And I think that's what art's all about. You, you have to keep looking at things and, and just record things in your mind and be aware of what's going on around you all the time. Look at all these lovely views across the bay here. That's magnificent. Of course, the sun is back lighting that, the edge of that cliff there. And here's a really big ravine that we're going into now. Look at these beautiful lush trees. Everything is, um, even on the hillsides there, even on the rocks there are there are little plants, and they're just covering all the rocks. Everything seems green. One of the reasons we're taking the trouble to do this long drive is that we are hoping to find a nice subject in the remote part of the island. 
plus the fact that uh, Charles Lindbergh's grave is at this end of the island somewhere, and I've always wondered where that would be and what inspired him to be choose to be buried in this uh, in this lovely spot. He was in fact a neighbor of mine in Roayton, Connecticut, when I lived in Darien. He was rather a private person though, and uh, I never had the pleasure of, of actually meeting him, or, although I'd love to have done that. Here we are in our beautiful spot that we've found, and we've, we've found this lovely little Hawaiian church. As soon as we saw it, we thought, this is it, because right in the distance, there's a valley in the mountain, and the edge of that hill says something great, and it also points right down to the church and the little grave here, which is Lindbergh's grave, right under this tree. What a beautiful place that he chose to be buried in. Absolutely gorgeous. What I'm really trying to do this moment is to see if this composition fits before I start blocking it out. Roof line of the church, roof line of the church, base of the church, grave. I'm going to push that a little further back. Yes, it's all going to fit beautifully. This tree will come about there. I'll have a nice lot of room for the sugar mill chimney, and in the distance, that little spot is very, very important there. Down here is where the, the garden goes to, the graveyard. It looks more like a garden. It's beautiful here. Lovely plantings and just gorgeous place. There we are. Okay, now I'm all set. I can now block in. Now one of the things that I want to do this time is to, and it's a challenge for me as well as anybody, uh, it's by no means an easy thing I've chosen here, but I want to try and simplify it. I don't want to do all everything that's there. I'm going to try and break it down into just a simple scene that's not all busy and frantic detail everywhere. So let's see how we get on. going from the darkest point. Establish the darks. I like to establish the darkest area, which is that hedge going right down the church there. These are not the not the actual colors. These are the these are blocking in colors. 
just establishing getting paint on the canvas covering it so that I got some paint to work into so I don't won't be all frustrated just simple cast shadows of the trees there and uh, here's a party of folks coming over to look at the grave what a lovely spot this show isn't really as much a how to paint show as how to be an artist what I'm trying to do is to show the artist the young artist how to view the world to give them another another angle what I see as a problem with art instruction today is that everyone seems to have forgotten how to look at the world in the way that the masters used to see the world when they looked at a beautiful view like this they didn't see a building and they saw a beautiful place and gorgeous colors and all the other little aspects and nuances that go on here there are volumes and volumes of works written on art and how to do it and how to do this and that but really all it is very simple shapes and very simple colors it's not a very complicated issue it just needs observation and a dedication to the craft of painting. I think I, as I'm working along, it, it does get to be exhilarating. I'm really a painter of light. I like to, I want to feel that sun streaming down or the, the light that I'm trying to create. Uh, I want a sense of light. And I'm painting light, basically. And uh, when I feel that coming in the painting, then I get very excited. I think I've always been an observer, and I've always been attracted to a certain view. I remember being in Derby way in the early days when I was at um, grammar school. I, I must have been 15 or something like that. Uh, there was a little store in Derby, a little art shop that sold local watercolors of the Peak District, which is a mountainous district, and there were mists, and it's a very misty place, and there were cloud, low-lying clouds, and, and uh, cows grazing on the hillsides, and uh, trees in the valleys, and that sort of thing. This fellow got a terrific sense of that into his paintings, and I picked up things like that. I always used to like looking at paintings, and, and I think that you, you get a feel for it, and uh, I don't think you can tell a person what to want or what to like, they've got to have that in themselves. I think when I was at the Royal Academy, one of the most significant things in my own progress was the proximity of so many galleries, uh, which had not only the old masters, but also Victorian paintings, and, uh, and even paintings of today that were being done by artists of the time that I thought were very good, and I could get a real good handle on painting uh, as it had been done to, to that day that I was at the Academy. And I, I think that was the most important facet of that particular period where I was. The thing that I really got most from was an understanding that each artist had a recognizable style or signature, I would call it. And that means that when you look at a painting, uh, you know whose it is. I think the thing that makes the style of an artist is the way that particular artist relates to nature. Uh, one can learn a lot in the classroom. One can learn a lot in the studio at the college. But what you already have is what your most important asset is, is, is how you view things and how you relate to things and how you get them down on canvas that is different from everybody else. And this is what I call the artist's signature, the recognizable characteristics in the style of the artist. And they're different from everybody.
Yeah, we're looking good. You see how I've left the church blank because I don't want to put that in until I know exactly where it is. I'm going up a little bit higher with the church now, a little bit higher with the roof line. Everything changes all the time as the balance becomes more apparent. But using the darks to create the negative space rather than the positive space is a good way of drawing things. The thing that young artists should realize is that you haven't come to paint the church, you've come to paint the space that the church is in. Drawing in the negative space is a good way to establish a shape. I've been to Hawaii three or four times, and the last time I was here, I came to do a painting of the whaling station at Lahaina. And the reason that I chose Lahaina was that it was where all the whale ships out of New Bedford had come to be stationed because the whaling was so good in this locality. And I wanted to create the drama of these vessels lying in the anchorage with this wonderful range of mountains that were very similar to the one that I'm painting here in, this, in the, uh, the little painting of the church. There we are, look at that. that. That suddenly happened then. And now all I need to do is just block in a little bit of this right-hand tree, which is very warm green. And uh, I'll have my composition pretty well blocked in. Now, we were just wondering what the tree, the name of the tree is there. Well, in the foreground yeah. in front of uh, Charles Lindbergh's grave is a Java plum tree. And behind it, the tree with the feathery foliage is a casuarina, oh. which is called an ironwood tree here because the wood is very dense and it's used for fence posts. Very hard. Very hard. Yeah. 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 It actually comes from Australia. Oh. And it's named that for that it's named because it resembles the cassowary bird's feathers. This is the tree. Leaves of the tree coming down to the front door, but it'll look good in a minute. Uh, says he hopefully. Very nice to meet you, by the way. I understand you're from Boston. I was, a long time ago. A long time ago. What a wonderful place you live in here. Is it, these all date palms? There's a co that's the a coconut, coconut palm. Palms. But is this one the same, this and one here? The others are date palms. Date palms. Oh. And do you, do you get dates from those? We get small dates, not yeah. too much uh, flesh on them, but it's yeah. it's not quite the way they like it here. It's not all that hot. So. Mm. This was the tree that completely um, made the painting. You've just got to get terribly lucky. And we got lucky here. Boy, did we get lucky.
and making it dark in the middle as it was when we first arrived to try and get the illusion of the light being in the same position. It's almost got two trunks all the way down here. There we are. Put that trunk in. Gradually, there we are. Ah, that's good. The artist who wants to become a professional artist should realize that there's a responsibility to being an artist as well. There's a responsibility to yourself and there's a responsibility to the, the big world out there because you've got the world really in your hands. You can use your talent to become powerful and you can be an influence. And that is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Everybody wants to be, be, be an influence. And you can do that just by succeeding with painting. Something must have happened to make me suddenly catch on to all this. And I think part of it was that my father uh, thought that I was a total failure. In fact, I heard him telling his friends that I was. It, hearing my father say that, um, it would have been devastating for me but I knew that I was going to be a success. It was a while before I think I uh, made him understand that I was going to be a success, and that was after he'd emigrated to Africa. See, when I went to London, he went to Africa. So he was not able to see my progress. Uh, I just wrote to him a lot, and he wrote to me a lot. I wanted to get there first, if you know what I mean. I didn't want him to look at every stage that I went through, you know, and methodically get up the ladder. I wanted to be up on top of the ladder before I let him, uh, so I didn't really communicate too much about what I was doing. I, I just wanted to achieve it on my own. I didn't want him in it uh, at that point. Yes, he did finally see what I'd done because they appeared in, uh, the city he was living in, which was Bulawayo, which was right in the middle of uh, Rhodesia then, uh, which was the industrial city in Rhodesia, and uh, he had a, a big drugstore there. About eight years later, he, he came back to visit me in, oh, I must have been one there, probably 12 years, he came back to visit me. I had a, bought a house in Farnham, Surrey. It was a beautiful double garage house on top of a hill. When he came, he was absolutely amazed uh, that uh, what he'd put me into had uh, resulted in this, uh, this uh, big style of life. He couldn't understand how art had uh, brought in enough money for all this. You know, he just, he, it was beyond his comprehension, you see. He wrote and said how much uh, he'd been impressed. And uh, it reminds me, actually, of Corot, when his father, of course, he learned to paint rather late in life. When he'd sold his first painting, at the age of 50, uh, his father said to a friend, uh, uh, the boy might do some good yet. Back to what I said before, which was that the, the artist has a responsibility to keep, if, if art is to be great, and I don't think that the greatest things have yet been done in painting. I think people think Rembrandt was great and Vermeer was great and all the rest of them were super terrific people. I don't think that the greatest work has been done in the world. I think it's still to come. But it'll only come if we get back to understanding what the real values and the real quality of art is all about. And I think that's been lost and we have to get it back. If there's one point I want to leave you with, it's to come out and experience painting from nature outside where all things are beautiful and where you will learn so much. The most important thing to remember is that you don't learn to paint from books, you learn to paint from experience, and this is what it's all about.